Hey everybody, we are getting into chapter 11 where we are going to be starting to work on three-dimensional objects. Everything we've done up to this point, a few examples way back in chapter 1, we were looking at nets and three-dimensional drawings and things like that, but that was so long ago. Everything we've done since then has been stuff we can put on a piece of paper, right? Triangles, circles, squares, polygons, all two-dimensional figures. Starting in this chapter, we're going to be looking at volume, surface area, those sort of things for three-dimensional objects, also known as space figures. All right. In this section, we're going to be talking about polyhedrons and the parts of polyhedrons, and we got a special little formula that goes with that, and also about cross-sections. So let's get right into it. Okay, when I talk about space figures, this is not the sort of thing I'm talking about. In geometry, a space figure is something like this. It's a fancy way of saying a 3D object. And you guys recognize some of these. Uh, this is a cube, or maybe not quite a cube. A uh, rectangular prism would be a better name for that thing. Cylinders, pyramids, pir prism, prism, cylinder, sphere, cone. Those are, are things we're going to be looking at in this chapter. In this, sec in this chapter. In this section specifically, we are talking about polyhedrons. Okay, so of the objects that we had back here, some of them are polyhedrons, some of them are not. A polyhedron is a space figure or a 3D figure whose surfaces are all polygons. Okay, so the ones that do not qualify as polyhedrons would be anything with a curved line, anything that does, has a surface that is not composed strictly of polygons. So those are all out of here. The rest of these are polyhedrons, okay? All of the surfaces are made up of rectangles, quadrilaterals, uh, triangles, pentagons, trapezoids, other kinds of, of uh, polygons, okay? So, every one of those flat surfaces is called a face, okay? They are all po polygons, and they are all can, can be thought of like as uh, uh, portions of a plane. So those are faces, they're labeled in this figure in blue, okay? And you'll see we got six of them, all right? An edge is any segment, any of these red segments is, or is an edge, and they're formed by the intersection of two faces, okay? Wherever two faces meet, we've got an edge. Now a vertex is where three or more edges intersect, okay? So all of the green dots represent points, that are vertices, okay? So faces are partial planes, edges are segments, vertices are points, all right? So you see how those work here. So let's look at this figure. How many faces, how many edges, and how many vertices are in the polyhedron, and name them. Pause for a sec, see if you can do it. Here we go with the answers, all right? Five faces, and they are triangles, DGH, triangle GFH, triangle FEH. So all four of these triangles up here, plus the quadrilateral on the bottom, DGFE, or DEFG, I guess I called it. Okay, so there are five faces. Eight edges. We'll mark those up in red here so you make sure you see them. Okay, eight edges. One, yeah, that wasn't one. Okay, let's try to be prettier here. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight. And the names of them are listed right here. They are all segments, D, E, E, F, etc. Right? Eight face, uh, eight edges. Five faces, eight edges. There are five vertices. And there are points D, E, F, G, and H. Cool? Now I want you to notice something. The number of faces plus the number of vertices equals the number of edges plus two. So... Five faces, five vertices, that's 10, that equals 8 plus 2. That's going to come in handy in just a second. Here's one for you to do, by the way. Faces, edges, vertices, pause, do it on your own. Here come answers. There are five faces, two triangles, three quadrilaterals, listed like that. There are nine edges, all segments, and there are six vertices, all those points at the corners. Notice again, the number of faces plus the number of vertices equals edges plus two. Five plus six equals nine plus two. 
That comes in real handy because a guy named Euler found out that works for any polyhedron. And he put it into a formula. Number of faces plus the number of vertices equals edges plus 2. This figure here happens to have 8 faces, 12 vertices. It has 18 edges. 20 equals 20. And you're going to use that to solve certain problems like this. So this polyhedron has 30 edges, 20 vertices. How many faces? Well, pop it into the formula. It must have 12 faces. Another one has 20 faces, 12 vertices. You can pause if you want. Here comes the answer, though. Faces are 20. Vertices are 12. Plug it into Euler's formula. It must be 30 edges. Okay, sound good? Sounds good. Now, going back to chapter one, remember nets? All right. If we actually took this figure here from the last slide and made a net and put it all, folded it out into one plane, okay, here are all the, the, the faces represented, but it's all folded out and laid out flat in front of us. Okay, Euler's formula changes in that case. Faces plus vertices equals edges plus one. Let me show you how that works. Okay, so just like we did back here, where we counted, let's do this one real fast as an example. Faces, I'm counting eight, right? Top, bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six sides makes a total of eight. Eight faces. Twelve vertices, let me put those in blue. Uh, sorry, let me put those in green. Just one, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, 12 vertices. How many edges? Put those in blue. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then 6 going up and down. 3, 4, 5, and 6. Got them? Got them. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing now, only in two dimensions we change up that formula. I see 12 faces still. Make them red. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I see 38 vertices. Those are our green ones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So you get the point. I'm not going to just... There's 38 of them there. And how many edges? Let's name now those in blue. Just counting them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So if I count all of those lines, I'm going to find 49 of them. And according to Euler's formula, we're going to see how that works out. All right, good enough. Next thing you got to talk about, cross-sections. Okay, this is an intersection of a solid and a plane. A cross-section is like a very thin slice of the solid. I think you have probably all sliced an apple in half. All right, and you get this kind of a shape. Let's try drawing on it. Right, that's a cross section. Okay, we're not going to use apples, we're going to use other kinds of shapes. So let's take that triangular prism that we were working with before and notice that it depends both on the shape of the figure and how we orient the plane that we're using to slice it apart. Okay, so for example, I'm going to take this figure, and if I wanted to cut it in half this way, whoosh, right, I'm going to slide that plane in there or slice it in half right there, and you can sometimes picture it like you're breaking it open. But sometimes you can also just picture that plane intersects that figure and forms a triangle. When we put this together in this way, we have a cross-section that's a triangle. Now, if our plane was... This orientation, we were cutting it apart this way. Notice what's going to happen. We're going to get a cross section that is a rectangle. Okay? So if you see, it's like if we took off the top and took off the bottom, we would see that red surface. That's the cross section on both of those figures. Okay? So that's how cross sections work. It depends on the shape and depends on how you slice it with the plane. Let's look at a couple more examples. These got really ugly. I couldn't make them pretty, but I can't take them out. So this nice little trapezoidal prism, if I cut it in half this way, right through the middle with an up and down plane, 
Notice how the cross section is a trapezoid. But if I take the same figure, similar figure, and I cut it this way, all right, and get rid of all my ugly drawings there, you'll notice that that figure forms a square when we cut it apart this way. Okay, so, uh, or, I'm sorry, rectangle. But anyway, so I should have maybe made that in red. So anyway, we've got a cross-sectional um, a cross section, a nice red, Minardi. Nice little red rectangle right there where that plane's cutting it in half. Okay, slicing it there. Okay, I want for you to think about on your own what's going to happen. Okay, maybe not on your own. If I take a cylinder and I slice it up this way, we have a circular cross section. Okay, if I slice it up this way, Cross that way. We're basically cutting it in half. You see how we're lining up in, in this manner, and we get a rectangular cross section. So that's how they work. One more thing we need to talk about a solid of revolution. If we have a line and we have a shape that's kind of like with it, and if we were to take this sucker and spin it really fast around that line, Maybe you guys have even done that sort of thing with, you know, I don't know, some little toys or something like this. So we spin it around and we look at whatever shape is formed by the uh, by, by this guy spinning in circles. We form a solid that's called a solid of revolution. Okay, so we spin that guy around and we're going to form something that looks like a cylinder. Okay, I hope that makes sense. It's a little hard to explain, but if we took it, and again, just spun it on its axis so that it went all the way around. You'll see how we form a cylinder as we show right here. So another example just for you to think about what happens if I use this shape and make a solid revolution by spinning it around the line. Think about it. Ants are coming. We're going to spin it around and form a cone. Okay? Kind of makes sense? Hope that's good. I will see you later.